Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Today I shall be ranking the Eastern Roman Emperors from Constantine the First to Constantine the Eleventh, going dynasty by dynasty. Joining me today is Mark, who shall be going with me through this journey through over 90 of Constantinople's emperors. Now, without further ado, let us begin! Right, now that we've finished with the Constantinian dynasty, we'll be dealing with Jovian and the Valentinians. So, today, to start off, we have Jovian. He is the emperor that took over after Julian. He was elected by the army during the middle of their campaign against Persia, where Julian had died, and it was up to him to sort it out. And I am tempted to put him in the decent pile. And I'll tell you why, Mark. The reason is, uh, although he only reigned for a year, he managed to extricate the army from Persia. They did take losses, but I think it's a case of it could have been a lot worse, and the terms to extricate the army, it did mean they had to give up fortresses such as Nisibis, which Constantius II had spent most of his reign trying to defend. But at the same time, if his army had been destroyed, it might not have made much of a difference. And actually managing to pull out and make a peace treaty with the Persians seems to have been the best thing he could have done. Hmm. And um, although there's not much more to his reign other than restoring Christianity as a of religion in the empire, he did continue toleration of paganism and largely kept things how they were. And his death was basically because of an accident. For those reasons, I've put him in the decent pile. What about you, Mark? I'm, I'm a bit more harsh. I would put Jovian in the mediocre category. Um, the reason for this is because the achievement of retreating, successfully retreating the army out of Mesopotamia, whilst, you know, good, it could have been worse. Just because something could have been worse does not mean it's necessarily successful. And the peace treaty he signed, you know, you, they're still fighting over Nisibis you know, centuries later, the Romans and the Persians. And also, he, he also he, he was seen to be surrendering Armenia. So I think the, the peace treaty itself, whilst, you know, the alternative is destroying the army and having the East exposed, so, you know, he did have to do the peace treaty. I'm not going to try and yeah. say he shouldn't have. And the campaign but, itself had failed. Yes. So there's not much but, he could do. No. But just because there wasn't much he could do and successfully join the army, I don't think that makes him more than mediocre. You know, he did what he set out to do. He didn't do anything spectacular. He didn't do anything properly good. He did what he had to do. I, I just don't think, I mean, I just don't think he's got the achievements there to be decent. Despite his restoration of Christianity as well, I really can't bring myself to put him any higher. Despite the fact that I do think he, and also, also do do remember the manner of his death is quite a ridiculous uh, tale. For those um, that don't know, he went to sleep in a house which had freshly painted walls, and the fumes from the walls interacted with a fire, which caused a reaction. It's probably carbon monoxide. Although um, there is a theory that he was poisoned, but people seem to say that about every emperor. <laughs> uh, Indeed. In the absence of any good, you know, properly good achievement, rather than just, you know, he managed to withdraw the army from the east and get them back to Roman territory. Aside from that, I just don't see any proper proper act which would yeah. justify me putting him any higher. I think you're right, Mark. Perhaps, perhaps I have been too generous. And he is in the same row as um, Constans, Julian, Constantius. So maybe I'll be mediocre, but I would say he's not incompetent. He's not no. bad. He is. He was perhaps the best person to take the throne at the time. An, an incompetent emperor in his shoes would have gotten the army destroyed. Yeah, right. Let's move on to Valentinian the Great. So, I am going to shove him in the great pile. I think he definitely deserves the title of the Great. 
He was elected emperor after Jovian. He ruled the empire for was it, 11 years, and he did a really good job. He combated corruption. He passed lots of reforms to the administration to improve uh, city councils. His A lot of his building programs were to do with improving infrastructure and useful buildings like granaries, aqueducts, and so on, rather than just columns and so on, and churches. He defeated the Great Conspiracy in Britain, so he gets Britain brownie points. His general Count Theodosius crushed the revolt in Africa by Firmus. He succeeded the Danube against the Franks and Alemanni, and also the uh, later against the Cardi and Sarmatians, which is where he ended up dying. And, uh, at least for the western part of the Roman Empire, he was their last great emperor. He was the last emperor to lead the empire from the west. And also he sorted out the succession by making his son Gratian co-emperor. He also realised that he couldn't rule the empire alone. And also the senate to avoid another Jovian, where after Jovian died there wasn't an emperor. He had Valens elected and gave him half the empire. And he never came into conflict with his other co-emperors, unlike the Constantinians. It's just a really good emperor. And the kind of failings he does have in that he's so Ammianus Marcellinus says he's a he was a very rust and could condone violence. He was as an emperor, he did a very good job. I agree completely. I he he definitely earns in my book the title The Great. That's why I have put him in the great category. His military achievements are excellent. Um particularly I, I like to think of him, even though Obviously, the geographical. Um, Would you like he's, to... he's much of the same vein as the soldier emperors at the end of the third century who stabilised the empire. Like yeah, that. yeah, sort of like the Aurelian or Probus. Yeah, and of course he was he was born in uh, Pannonia, I believe. Um, yes. So, um, but he his uh, particularly the the keeping hold of Britain when it mm. did look like that Britain could have been lost. I, I think was a, um, a, a good, a great achievement. The only real reason why I, I really couldn't bring myself to put him, any heart, put him in the exceptional category is that it has to be, I think, a fine line uh, between the two. And yeah. he was undoubtedly great, but I, I yeah. don't quite feel that he's a... Uh, we can feel him re his repercussions throughout history from him. Yeah, uh, I mean, the exceptional category is for kind of emperors that were truly one of a kind, whereas great, there are a lot of great emperors, and I think Valentinian is by far deserving them. Yes, yes, uh, uh, undoubtedly. Valens. <laughs> ah, Valens. So, to me, Valens is kind of the Valentinian brother, but minus one. He, he did a lot of the same things as Valentinian, in that he was an uh, active campaigner, he he managed to defeat the Armenians and also the Saracens with considerable difficulty. He cleared up corruption, he was a good administrator, and he built lots of infrastructure like the Aqueduct of Valens, which you can still see in Istanbul today. But two things, just kind of in his general rule of the empire, he always seemed a bit less able than his brother Valentinian. As I said before, his uh, dealings with the Saracens and Queen Mavia are uh, considerable. You could quite easily argue that she won that war, but he also, with difficulty, defeated Procopius. Not in the actual defeating of him, but the fact that Procopius managed to get so powerful so quickly, mm. I feel like Valentinian could have dealt with that matter much easier than Valens did. But at the end of the day, when Procopius actually had to fight Valens, Valens defeated him. But not before Procopius had managed to take Constantinople, had two legions defect to him, and did a fairly decent job of nearly restoring the Constantinian. I think Valens's main falling down is his handling of the Gothic crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, the Roman Empire had dealt with mass migrations of barbarians before. So, like, Aurelian had moved the nation of the Harpy into Pannonia without any hassle, as had many other emperors. And Valens, when the Goths arrived, this seemed to be just another one of these 
incorporations of barbarians into the empire. But for some reason, uh, managed to choose some of the worst officials to carry this out, and because he was busy in the east dealing with the Saracens and stuff, he wasn't checking up on it. And the officials managed to make such a bollocks up of the whole situation <laughs> that, that by the time Valens actually came, the whole Gothic nation was in revolt against him. Uh, the Visigoths, that is. And he had to deal with them. Instead of waiting for reinforcements coming from the west under Gratian, he listened to his advisors, which you should never do, and decided to attack the Goths and had his entire army wiped out. His successor Theodosius spent the next five or six years having to pick up the pieces, which would also introduce the Visigoths into the Empire as a somewhat hostile force, which would eventually end up in the sack of Rome in 410. But where to place him? I don't know, it's um... I don't think he's a bad Emperor. Or necessarily incompetent, he's just kind of... a bit naff. I'm gonna put him in mediocre. I don't feel strongly one way or the other about him. He was also an Aryan and persecuted Nicene Christians. There we go. I also have put him in the uh, mediocre category. Yeah. One thing I would add to your excellent summary of his reign is he was quite financially astute. Militarily, on the other hand, when dealing with the Goths, <clears throat> um, but financially he was very astute. But his legacy, no matter what else, whatever, any other good acts he did, his legacy is his absolute catastrophe at a Adrianople. There was a book written about the Valentinians called Valens and the Failure of Empire. Well, I mean, I mean, you, I mean, whether or not we can fully trust Master Linus' account, you do have to take all, all primary sources for what they are back in uh, ancient Rome, but... Mm. He, ju he just seems to have just bungled the entire battle, like, from the very start. Because, I mean, even with his, even with the Goths rebelling in the first place, if he was able to crush them, then, well, you know, I, I think we'd seen it just as a minor revolt, successfully dealt with. Yeah. But, <laughs> unfortunately, this disaster can trace then from that all the way to the, uh, the sacking of Rome, the withdrawing of legions from the Rhine in the 5th century to deal with the Goths. Yeah. It, it, it just sort of, it just snowballs into a major disaster for the Empire, which has massive consequences going into the, uh, going into the... Yeah. And also, because the East at this point didn't have quite as many soldiers as the West, the destruction of this army basically left the Balkans completely defenceless other than the Western legions on the way under Gratian. I know that some historians have been revising, not just using Ammianus, but other sources to try and get a bit more of an approval of why Valens did it. But fundamentally, if he had waited, for Gratian to arrive and destroyed them together as Theodosius and Gratian eventually would. He may have avoided it. I think ultimately, even if he had more military reasons for attacking when he did, ultimately it was his error in not waiting for more men that led to his own destruction. What do you think? I think that's a good summary of what he did do wrong. Our, I know Ammianus Marcellinus compares it to Canai. Speaking of Gratian, why don't you go first? What do you think of Gratian? Gratian I actually found a tough one uh, compared to particularly Valentinian and Valens, who I, I sort of had in my mind as where I would put them. But I would put him in the decent category. Uh, okay. Um, he's undoubtedly better than uh, Valens and Jovian. He was able to win a series of conflicts. Yeah. He uh, defeated some Goths, I believe, when they went into Pannonia. I mean, he was able to mend somewhat the crisis that had uh, occurred with as a result of his um, uncle, with the result of Valens' errors, shall we say. But I don't really think one can put him much farther because Magnus Maximus's revolt breaking out towards Indeed. the end of his reign. But, you know, there is some good which he did. Um, he issued the Edict of Thessalonica, which made oh. Arian Christianity illegal. Uh, so there's that. Um, yeah. One could, I suppose, make the argument that it's with religious toleration. But I think that having various priests and congregations basically beating each other up over this sort of issue with the Roman state basically try, trying to keep out of it did need to be sorted out. His legacy is in perhaps um, he did a lot of the stamping out of pagan institutions in the city of Rome itself. He removed the altar of victory from the yeah. Senate. 
Anything else but, to say about Gratian? I don't think I could put him any higher, but I think it'd be far too harsh to put him lower because he, he, he didn't necessarily do a bad job. Yeah, I would agree. I would also put him in decent because he was 16 when he became senior emperor. He was well educated and from all accounts a decent enough soldier. He managed to keep the Rhine and Danube frontiers from buckling. When they did start to break through, it was only because he had to redirect soldiers east to deal with the Gothic crisis. When that did happen, he decided to turn back and deal with the Alemanni first. His acceptance of Theodosius as Emperor of the East was a good choice because Theodosius seems to have been the right man for the situation. He also accepted his brother when he uh, Valentinian II was proclaimed Emperor after Valentinian I died, though again his attempt to accommodate Emperors to maintain kind of an imperial cordiality and he reinforced Nicene Christianity and clamped down on Arianism and Paganism which is neither here nor there really. His kind of downfall comes from his own personality really and also his he managed to piss off the army which you should never do and by being favorable to his Alan bodyguard. Although whether this is a uh, kind of a story made up after the fact kind of vain why he was murdered is something that bears investigation. I mean, isn't this the unbelievable because it should be emperors yeah. often used uh, barbarians as, as personal yeah. bodyguard. From all the counts, he, just, he does seem to be competent, and especially for someone of quite a young age to uh, handle all of these things is impressive enough. But yeah, I wouldn't put him any higher. Now we come to the last Valentinian. Valentinian the second. Now his is very difficult to rate, in my opinion, because although he reigned for something like 16 years as a senior emperor, he never actually ruled. Mm. He was either too young, because he was like five when he became emperor in uh, 375. Yeah. By the time he actually became emperor, things had changed quite significantly. His when he was emperor, his kind of his advisors and his mother. Uh, Justina ruled and basically ruled instead of him and when he was ruling with Magnus Maximus in the west who was in command of most of the west he mainly just had control over Italy and I think Africa and Illyricum so he didn't have that much of the empire to rule over except after Magnus Maximus died he then became emperor of all of the west. Valentine seconds are almost a sign of things to come. Hmm. Um, because the whole Arbogast is an omen of the Ricama, uh, yeah. I think, of, of the 5th century. The Generalissimos, as some historians have called them. He did attempt to try and get rid of Arbogast, because he was basically a prisoner at that point. Perhaps his being killed was just a case of kill or be killed for Arbogast. This is a difficult one, because I don't really know where to put him. I mean, I do hmm. have a, I have a bit of a soft spot for him, because he is... It is quite a story of what happened to him, but might just keep him in unrankable. No, no that's... <laughs> I think, regardless of how he ruled, or as in this case, didn't rule, he was still very important as the last member of the Valentinian dynasty, which time and again meant that Theodosius was always attempt was always backing his side. It did kind of unite in a way the western half of the empire under him. Uh, if nothing else, just because he was the son of Valentinian. And apart from Magnus Maximus, who revolted against Gratian for the four years he was seen in the west, there didn't have any revolt set really or much difficulty in the West. Um, there is another trouble there in that most sources focus on Theodosius. There isn't that much information about what Valentinian did, Mag or Magnus Maximus for that matter. What do you think, Mark? I think I, I've put him in mediocre. Uh, not mediocre, in incompetent even. The reason is, I mean, yes, we do have the bias in the sources of Theodosius. Like everyone's going to focus on Theodosius in this, in this period. But, you know, when he was forced to flee for Maximus, I mean, obviously he's young. By the time he actually got, when Theodosius then marched back west, it, he would have been, I think, 16, yeah, in the end. But, you know, I mean, when he's out in the east, he, he wasn't really being emperor at that point. It seems that 
Theodosius sort of takes some convincing to come to march back west and put Valentine the second back on. Well, he gets uh, a deal from Justina yeah. to do it. And then, okay, then then once we get to his actual reign, you know, once he's uh, back in uh, Italy, eighty-eight to uh, ninety-two. I say, I mean, I mean, the, the the degree to which Arbogast was dominating him for the entirety of that reign, I, I don't think anyone can quite say. But you know, he, he managed to get himself killed, which seems to be what some of his return yeah. twist. He just managed to alienate the main general in the area to the extent that he then uh, unfortunately gets murdered for it and once it, I mean I don't think he's a bad or awful because he didn't do anything bad or awful you know um, that's we're why we're not I even think. quite sure how he died or not we know he was hanged but we don't know if it was suicide or murder but in, in the absence of any bad or actual acts on his part yeah I, I i think that on that issue on that basis i mean uh, incompetent because uh don't really know what else to do yeah oh yeah well uh, he's very hard where to, where to put him <laughs> yeah there isn't a kind of non-entity rank i might just put him in unrankable because i really do not know would you yeah. not argue, uh, or not? And I know he did try, but at the end of the day, he was dominated by Arbogast. Is not perhaps yeah. a degree of incompetency? The fact that he wasn't able to command the support to isolate and remove Arbogast, he, he wasn't able to reassert him. Yeah, that is a good point. I think I will put him in incompetent, but with caveat. Just really don't really know that much. It's a yeah. bit like Constantine the Second in a way. Is that yeah. even less so than Constantine? Because oh well. Okay, so we've done the Valentinian dynasty. So we've got two down. Many more to go. <laughs> Indeed. Many more to go. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for coming. Um, and oh, Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on all of these emperors. And next time we'll be doing the Theodosian dynasty.